is the process that he went through to get to become a uh, radio operator. Uh, Joe uh, entered the Army in August of 1942, uh, not all that long after uh, Pearl Harbor, quite frankly. At the time he entered, he left his uh, new bride, who was expecting, at her home in Grand Island, Nebraska, and it was sent to uh, Kearns, Utah, for a month of Army basic training. Uh, this is known as boot camp. After that, he was sent to a school in Madison, Wisconsin for a two-month course in uh, radio operating. Uh, things like uh, learning to do uh, the uh, Morris Code and so forth were taught at that course. And depending upon your aptitude and how well you did with all of these things, uh, you would then get a fur further assignments and more training. And uh, finally, uh, Joe completed the uh, training there, and this was the way he was able to communicate with home. It wasn't by cell phone or iPad uh, or Skype. It was through a Western Union telegram, and here he is saying that he's uh, going to be leaving uh, uh, his training in Madison, Wisconsin, for some place. And when he gets there, he'll hope to have time to write a letter and tell you where he is. So when he was gone on that part of uh, the trip into the training, he was then sent to uh, Florida, Boca Raton. And Boca Raton is where they had the big training uh, program for, for radio and uh, radar. They, he went in with a group that they spent a total of five months becoming qualified in, in radar. And as you've already heard, you couldn't say radar, it was radio. And so that's what they called it. And uh, on the way down there, it was interesting because uh, Joe uh, was on the train, and they, the train went through Grand Island, Nebraska. Joe's wife lived three blocks from the train station, and the, uh, the pilot, or the uh, pilot, uh, the sergeant wouldn't let him off to make even a phone call home. Uh, as a consequence, uh, he didn't see his daughter until she was over two. So, and uh, the training, this is a certificate showing that you've completed one of these steps in the training program. Here's the radar operators class in Boca Raton, and uh, they were there, like I said, for many months. And when they got done with this, what they did was they were then sent to an actual squadron that was going to form up uh, to go overseas. Uh, at Orlando Air Base on the uh, Fe February the 20th of 1943, the 417th Night Fighter Squadron was originated. It didn't have any people, but it existed on paper. It was the fourth of four squadrons uh, of night fighters to be initially commissioned and sent to Europe. There were other squadrons of night fighters during the course of the war, primarily in the Pacific. But these four squadrons were the only European squadrons, and they were the only ones that flew the bow fighter. So all four squadrons went over. They went over in numerical sequence. They were the fourth, uh, 14th, the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th. So Joe was assigned to the 417th, and uh, it was forming at an auxiliary base to the Orlando base, which was over in Kissimmee. And over there, they had night fighters, the U.S. night fighters. Now, Britt told you we didn't have any, but well, we didn't have any good ones. What they had were these uh, old uh, A-20 uh, attack airplanes, and uh, they had modified those to have radar on them, and when they did that, they called them P-70s. So that was the airplane that they were flying uh, there in Kissimmee. And it was pretty exciting times. The, uh, the air crews uh, got between someplace between uh, 40 and maybe 140 hours of flying these. Now this flying was really, really intense. And uh, here's a picture that has showed up on the uh, uh, internet a number of times of one of the 417s, uh, P-470s, uh, doing low-level playing around in the Kissimmee area down by the beach. 
So it wasn't all uh, hard work, but there was a little bit of fun. But uh, they had a tough time with these old airplanes, getting them to, uh, to do the work. And the radar was particularly tricky, like Brick said, because you have these two radar scopes and you have to look at them and think opposite of each other. And then one is for vertical and one is for lateral, and it was a real challenge. The 417th was only about six weeks old when it was declared that it was combat ready. And they were put, uh, they were marched rather, to the uh, Kissimmee uh, train station, put on a troop train, and taken to uh, Camp, Kilmer, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey, which is just across the, the river from uh, Manhattan. And uh, they got there, everything in the military is hurry up and wait. It took them eight days to get processed after they got there, which mainly meant that was the time for them to get more shots and uh, write letters home. Uh, they finally did get, let them use the telephones when they were there for about the last day. Then they put them on a ferry, took them across to Manhattan, and there they met up with the uh, trans troop transport, the Queen Elizabeth, which was probably about the biggest ship in the world at the time. Uh, if you've been down to uh, Long Beach and seen the Queen Mary, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth are uh, sister ships. In fact, we took uh, Joe down there one time, and uh, he said, right here, right next to that smokestack, that's where I slept. <laughs> so it, he thought it was the same ship, and they're that close together. So at this point, they are on the ship for a grand total of six days. They end up in Scotland, and uh, there they go into the training program that the British used for their uh, night fighter people. They split off the ground forces and sent them through the ground schools on what the airplane was, how it worked, and how its radar worked. They took the, uh, the ROs and sent them off to the British RO school, and the pilots all went into transition school to learn how to fly the bow fighter itself. After completing their uh, coursework and uh, flight training uh, in, uh, in England, the uh, crews were brought back uh, together and uh, then prepared to receive their airplanes and actually uh, go into combat. But one of the things that was interesting in this whole process is all of the ROs were enlisted men. They started off as privates, some of them were corporals. By the end of their training, most of them were corporals and some of them were sergeants. And when they got to England, uh, they found out that life was not really very good for an enlisted person. Uh, the British are very class conscious and enlisted people of any type, particularly Americans, are pretty close to the low end of that. On the other side, pilots are highly regarded because they are pilots. And they were all officers and gentlemen and all had the ranks of second lieutenant and higher. So uh, it was a real digression between them. But one of the things that the Army Air Force did was to say, okay, once you've completed your radar training, we are going to commission you. And so they commissioned them as officers, as flight officers, which is a grade below second lieutenant. So they didn't give them everything, but what they did do was they took all of them and said, now that your officers are going to be officers, this picture here was taken on July the 29th, 1943, as the 11 ROs, uh, needing to be commissioned, were getting on the train to go into London to get their new uniforms, signifying that they would now be officers. Here they are the next day, newly commissioned in their uh, officer uh, uniforms, and uh, heading back to, to the base. Uh, and during this training in, in, in England, they, that was when they paired up the pilots and the ROs. And the deal was this, you really have to think alike, work together, and be a team. And so in the course of the training, the, the teams have naturally formed. And uh, uh, Jack Kerwin and Joe Van Lacken were two guys that got together, hit it off well, and were able then to uh, proceed. Uh, they were designated as Bishop 59. And Bishop 59 meant that that was their crew and uh, name and so forth, and all of the transactions with ground control uh, records and so forth. All of the, uh, the pilots were given this bishop number starting with 50, 
right, so the lowest number, and so uh, this just happened to be a coincidental thing that they got the number 59, but that was their call sign. They then uh, were ready to go into combat, and uh, at this point, I think the, the squadron has only existed for six months, and these guys are now trained and ready to go out and defend our country. At that point, they were uh, given 12 bow fighters, and I've recently been in contact with the Royal Air Force Museum to try to find out just exactly what was the story and the history on these uh, airplanes when they, they came over. And uh, like Rick said, they were old. Later on, they did get a few that probably were newly manufactured, but for the most part, uh, these were old airplanes new to them. At that point, they also suffered, suffered their first casualties. When on a training mission, uh, one of the bow fighters uh, went into the water when it was doing uh, gunnery uh, work. The 417th then had 11 airplanes and is now ready to go to combat and they are assigned to North Africa. So uh, the African theater was a very busy place in 1943. And uh, what happened is uh, the 417th flew from up here 1,200 miles down and landed here at the Rock of Gibraltar. Uh, the 11 airplanes did, refueled, and then from there flew on over here to Oran in uh, Algeria, or what was then called Algeria. And uh, they were not all crewed up at that point. Joe was left, he, he got to fly. Jack was not, he had to come down on the Durban Castle, a freighter. Uh, he with the rest of the squadron, some 250 people, uh, were came down on that old freighter and uh, spent some 30 days getting to the same place. At that point, though, when the airplanes got there, they immediately started doing combat uh, patrols. And so things went from uh, just busy to busy and, and really dangerous all in a very short time. Now, uh, as the, we're gonna talk a little more later about the sequence of events and the things that transpired during the course of the war. But uh, what actually ended up happening is the 417th kept the bow fighters up until they were the very last ones flying them. And that was in March of 1945 when they got through with their bow fighters. Uh, at this point, uh, I've identified at least 68 different bow fighters that were assigned to the squadron. Uh, they went through them bad. Uh, it was really bad uh, later in the war when they were sent to uh, France. Uh, they lost uh, about 20 airplanes up there in, in 16 weeks. So it, it, was, it was really a tough, tough time. The squadron served starting here in, uh, in North Africa at Iran and Algiers. They moved up here uh, after several months. They were over in uh, Tunis for a while. And then finally, after, uh, during the battle for Italy over here, the squadron moved up to Corsica. And they operated out of Corsica, Corsica for quite a while. Then when it came time for the southern invasion of Europe, after D-Day, which was up here, you know, D-Day occurred on the northern shore, and that was June the 6th, uh, 1944. Uh, in August, they then came in here in the southern France and the 417th was assigned the job of supporting the invasion from the south down here uh, at, at night. And so they did uh, that uh, support there. So uh, after that period of time, that was about the time that Joe had uh, completed his tour. Uh, he actually had, at this point being what, 23 and a half years old, was one of the old men in the squadron. He had the highest amount of combat uh, time for the ROs, and he was uh, rotated home in, in August uh, of 44. Uh, the war wasn't over for him at that time because uh, he then went over to uh, Fresno, and where he became part of the, uh, the school for the B-61 night fighter, the Black Widow, uh, for transitioning new radar operators into that airplane. And he, was, he served in that role on through the end of the war. The uh, squadron had a lot of people at Fresno. Uh, 
And uh, here is uh, a picture of the, some of the uh, 417th uh, families uh, at a dinner that they had there at the uh, air base. So uh, that completes this portion of my presentation and I'd like to ask Rick to come back up here and uh, uh, carry on with the rest of our story. Cheers again, Rick. So Dan talked about the P-70. Um, I'm going to, uh, a quick story about, uh, I had a gentleman talk to me earlier about